Okay, welcome everybody. We will give everyone a few minutes to join as we always do before we hop into updates and um, a little bit of a welcome message. And of course, talk a little bit about what we are here today to discuss. I'm really excited for this panel. I think that it is a panel that will be unique and a little bit different than our traditional like OCD specific panels. This will still be specific, but it is going to, it's going to look different. And as a lot of, you know, it certainly is something I'll share some of my personal experience because I, um, a lot of this is going to apply to me as you know, being in a place right now in my life where I have a six month old. So I'll talk a little bit about that and, and personally what it's been like, cause I know that's been a question and something we've, I always share openly, so I want to continue to do so. So as you guys are joining, please make sure you tell us who you are and where you're going from. Hi, Justin. Good to see you. Others, please make sure you say hi and um, give yourself a warm welcome so that we can say hi to you and hopefully provide some appropriate support based on geographic location as well. A couple of updates before we hop in that we always want to address and talk about. So the first and foremost, you guys know, this is not intended to replace therapy. The point of these webinars and live events is for us to really do our best to bring some amazing education and content, but it's not intended to be individual therapy. So we really encourage you to find your own individual provider to seek out and um, get a really good individualized treatment plan. Of course, if you're in crisis or in an emergency, and if you're feeling unsafe or suicidal, this is not the appropriate place to get resources or get urgent help. If you are feeling unsafe, we want you to go to your local emergency room, call 911, or call the suicide prevention hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Just a reminder that we really want this to be a safe space. And so we ask that you are mindful of personal questions. Uh, we want you to know that if you post them, other people can see them. And of course, be mindful as well if you're responding to other people's questions. Sometimes we find ourselves wanting to give advice to others, but that advice might actually be more beneficial to us as an individual because everyone's treatments should be individualized. So we really ask you to save some of those personal, you can ask us personal questions, but to refrain by giving from giving personal advice to others. Of course, there's amazing live streams and so many incredible events happening. In particular, tomorrow we are doing a panel on veterans and OCD. It'll be specifically focused on PTSD, OCD, and the veteran population. So this will be a really awesome webinar and something I certainly recommend that you check out. It is tomorrow, Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Of course, you can go to iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind to find out about all of our upcoming events and what we have going on. So make sure you check that out as well. Today, I am so excited for us to really dive into a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And as many of you know, it is something that I personally have dealt with and am continuing to deal with. So today, we're really going to be talking about perinatal OCD and anxiety. And that, that term's actually a little bit new. I think a lot of times people might think, what does perinatal mean? What is the perinatal period, right? So we really are going to be I'm hoping to provide resources and information on kind of the whole process from pregnancy all the way to postpartum and to really talk about differentiating symptoms, differentiating diagnosis and treatment and how it differs. So I'm really excited to introduce our guests because we have two amazing experts in the field. And I'm excited that today we have both a clinical psychologist and a psychiatrist so that we can make sure we cover those medication questions as well as those behavioral or intervention or therapy questions that you might have. So I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Rohr. Dr. Jessica Rohr is a board-certified clinical psychologist with an additional certification in perinatal mental health. She's the director of women's health at, I'm sorry, and a staff psychologist at Houston Methodist, primarily serving employees and dependents through their new clinic. She's engaged in research and advocacy efforts that directly relate to new clinical interventions that are accessible and effective for women. Dr. Rohr received her PhD in clinical psychology and completed her internship and postdoc at the Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center right here in Houston, where I actually did my postdoc as well. And so Jessica and I have collaborated on a lot of different work and worked together. I know our paths have crossed, but I'm so excited to have you here. And I know that our, our entire OCD community is excited to hear from you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. And Dr. Netherton. So Dr. Elizabeth Netherton completed her medical education at the University of Texas at Houston McGovern Medical School and her residency training right here at Baylor College of Medicine. She, ser she has served on faculty at BCM and the Menninger Clinic, where she co-developed the Menninger Moms Program. She currently serves as the regional director for Texas at MindPath, a community psychiatry practice. And her clinical work focuses on women's mental health, motherhood, and personality disorders. So Dr. Netherton, I know 
We're really excited to have you here. We're excited to hear about medication, medication management, and really hear about all your expertise and background that you bring to this topic. Thank you, so excited to be here as well. So I, I wanna encourage everybody, we're gonna hop in, but I wanna encourage everyone to please submit questions that you have along the way. I already see a couple different topics and a lot of folks talking about um, how they're excited to hear about this and that this is an important topic. So again, if you have questions, whether it's for now, for the future, for someone you love or yourself, please make sure you submit them and we will do our best to answer them along the way. I wanna start with just some basics, if that's okay. And so um, Jessica, I'm gonna start with you and I, I wanna ask kind of a couple questions, but I think the the biggest question is, let's kind of think about most of the viewers watching are in the OCD arena, either clinicians or individuals with OCD or family members. And so I know for me, I was super anxious at the thought of getting pregnant. And I was really anxious at the thought of not just going through pregnancy, but postpartum. Um, and I think my family actually was as well. I remember sitting down with my mom while I was pregnant and she kind of was like, okay, so what's the mental health plan? Like once baby's here and like, what are you doing to make sure you have a good team? And, you know, there was just this extra layer of anxiety of we already know about postpartum mental health, but then when you already live with a diagnosed condition, right, there's even a higher chance or higher likelihood that you'll see symptoms increase. And so can we talk a little bit, let's start with talking a little bit about that of kind of what is, like, what do we know about mental health in um, maybe even the pregnancy period, and then we'll go to postpartum. But what do you often see and what do we what do we know or not know as far as mental health, mental health changes, first diagnosis, somebody who's already diagnosed and the impact that might have? So I love, I love that you guys sat down and had that conversation. This is something that Dr. Netherton and I have talked about for years now is the wish that that would be a, a common conversation that every new mother would have in their pregnancy period is what's the mental health plan? What are our risk factors here? Um, what, and what's our support going to look like? What, what are we going to do? Because so many times people get to the point of needing it and they haven't even talked about it yet. So I also, I struggled with postpartum depression after my first Clinical psychologists should kept saying I should have known better, <laughs> but it's just it's, it's something that's very um, we just don't talk about it enough. Um, mental health during pregnancy, we are starting to learn that um, we are starting to learn that more people struggle with it than we previously realized. Um, we know that postpartum depression, about one in five women develop postpartum depression, but we also have an understanding that that is probably more of an umbrella term for postpartum distress. So um, any, any difficulties that happen um, with mental health postpartum kind of get wrapped into depression, um, anxiety, OCD, um, any other issues that may not even meet the full, the full criteria. And there are, we know what the risk factors are. This is what's so, so frustrating and also exciting when you do get to talk to somebody. We know what the risk factors are. A previous mental health diagnosis. I had struggled with anxiety in the past. I, that, that was a risk factor for me. Um, if it's your first baby and there's some kind of ideas about why that might be the case, why your first baby may put you at increased risk for perinatal and postpartum distress. Um, but I think people can guess you know, there's, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of kind of societal pressure on the way that pregnancy should go. Motherhood should go that you have these plans. Um, so there are a lot of kind of psychological factors, social factors that impact the development of mental health issues and then hormonal factors, um, which Dr. Netherton can speak to really nicely. Um, but the the hormonal changes that come along with that are. Um, are very real <laughs> and very important and can be very distressing. Um, so when we talk about postpartum depression, that's another piece of it. They're, they're, we're starting to learn more that some of these issues can be seen during pregnancy, which is that perinatal, what we would call perinatal mental health or perinatal, perinatal distress. And so when you, when you're talking about kind of being able to recognize some of these signs or symptoms, like what would that look like? And, you know, I think this is an important question for us to talk about, because I'll share personally as somebody who's lived with OCD, right? Part of living with OCD and living with a mental health condition is constant management, right? So that means that there can be days I have triggers or there's days that like, you know, I need to readdress or am I in forget being pregnant, right? In my normal everyday life. And so how during pregnancy, like what might be some signs for us to say, okay, like we're seeing an increase, like how, how would we be able to say this is above the norm or this is something that needs some extra attention? 
So the two, the two factors that I come back to over and over again are, is it causing you distress and is it impairing your functioning? And those are the two pieces that um, if there are some experiences that are getting in the way of your life that you're spending so much time on that, they, that you're not able to do the things that are important to you and it's upsetting you in some way, it's, it's, it's very, it's, um, you don't like it to be that way, then that's a problem. Um, we, what's really tough, especially with pregnancy, um, is that there are a lot of, especially with pregnancy and OCD with this overlap, is there are a lot of things that are, you are asked to do and monitor during pregnancy that can easily then become obsessions and compulsions. This is just an example, kit counts. Mothers are asked to keep kit counts. This means for people who aren't pregnant or haven't gone through this, you're supposed to count how many kicks your, once your baby starts moving, how many kicks they have. When you really dig down into it, if there's not kind of an OCD process present, um, or an anxiety process present, it means kind of get into the habit of knowing when they're more mobile and when they're not. So you can kind of keep, but you can imagine how quickly that could lead into an obsession and a, and a compulsive behavior to try to, to come up with the anxiety around that. And there are pieces all through pregnancy um, that can easily become, that can go from a, I'm taking care of my baby the right way to I'm in a lot of distress right now. Totally. You know, and one of two of the things that I, um, I didn't talk a lot about this because I actually wasn't super open about even being pregnant. I kind of announced my pregnancy to the OCD community when I was having my baby because I could hide it through Zoom. Um, and it was something I kind of wanted to navigate. But the one thing I struggled with is I was sick my entire pregnancy and I was sick until the day I delivered. And for me, when you're that sick and you're not getting good sleep, right? Of course my OCD is going to be increased or my anxiety is going to be increased because we know like emotionally, right? I'm not in the same headspace I am when I'm feeling emotionally healthy um, or physically healthy, I should say as well. And so, you know, I think that's the second piece to really, really think about is that, you know, when we're talking about the hormonal shifts and all of the various things that come along with pregnancy, it doesn't necessarily mean like, okay, you know, that, is going to change OCD, but of course it's going to have an impact on it, right? It's going to have an impact on your mental health. We talk a lot about this where people say like, okay, Liz, is there foods people with OCD should or shouldn't eat? What do you think about exercise, right? And my feedback is always the same, which is that candidly, right, the evidence shows us that like food and exercise are not evidence-based interventions for OCD. We're not going to treat your OCD with food and exercise. However, the healthier you are and the better you feel, right, the more you might be able to resist engaging in rituals and do the work that you need to do. Where if I'm feeling like really tired and I'm feeling fatigued and I'm not eating well, right, I might have less energy to be able to do the ERP work. And so I think that's important to think about with pregnancy too, is like the impact it has on your body and the way you feel and how that certainly uh, can impact, you know, your mental health during that time. So Elizabeth, let's hop down to you because I think it'd be really great for us to think about from a psychiatric standpoint, all of these points that come into play, but in particular medication and what do people do? Absolutely. And, and if it's okay, I'd like to tag on to what you were just talking about, about sleep, because I think that is something that we really, um, I think providers often forget to ask pregnant women about often forget to ask new parents about period, um, but it's critically important. And, and we can tie um, exacerbations in depression, exacerbations in anxiety, exacerbations in OCD symptoms often back to disruptions in sleep um, and disrupting somebody's sleep. Sleep depriving somebody is, is enough to lead to increased symptoms in, in many people, whether a baby is involved or not. Uh, but I think culturally, we expect folks to be able to go without sleep for long periods of time. That's just kind of the way having a new baby is. That's the way being pregnant is. Um, and, you know, aren't you grateful for being pregnant? And, and I think we forget to, to go back and think more critically about, you know, is this mom sleeping? How do we get mom better sleep? How do we get mom better protected time for sleep? Um, because it's really critical. You know, if, if I'm going to be adding medications to help to help somebody, um, you know, those medications might not get us very far if the other pieces are not in place, if mom is not able to sleep enough, um, if mom is not able to get adequate nutrition and take care of herself well enough. So, so that really lays the foundation, um, really lays the foundation for everything else that we do. And, and then um, I'd also love to add, I, I know Dr. Rohr was talking about the idea of 
um, distress and the idea of impacting functioning. And I was thinking also um, that it's really important to be thinking about whether OCD symptoms are getting in the way of enjoying the baby um, and enjoying the experience. I, I know when I was postpartum with my second, um, one of my mentors asked me if I was um, if I was enjoying it, if I was enjoying the baby. And I was thinking, well, that is the craziest question. Of course, I'm not enjoying this. This is no fun at all. I haven't slept in, you know, I haven't slept in days. Um, but but it's a common, I think that is a common experience for new moms that are struggling with depression and anxiety. The idea that this is, this is not enjoyable at all. And, and we should be taking that into account as prescribers when we think about, is it time to add medication? hundred percent. And so a lot of our viewers, you know, do take medication for their OCD and anxiety symptoms. And one of the questions they always want to be thinking about is, will I need to shift the medications that I'm on? Um, or are they safe for pregnancy? And can I stay on them? You know, so it's one of the, so I think the two questions we'd love to hear is what medications are safe um, during pregnancy and, and when you're breast, potentially breastfeeding or postpartum. And then second, which ones are not that, that patients would definitely want to plan or try their best to get off of before conceiving or considering mm -hmm. pregnancy? Absolutely. So I think that's a really common question that we get. Um, we get in our offices and we get from moms that are planning pregnancy or are already pregnant um, and, and wondering about how to continue with their mental health treatment. And, and I would just, um, I would step back and say that, that we really hesitate um, for almost every medication. We really hesitate to say, this medication is better than this one. This medication is um, safe. This one is not safe because really that gets us away from um, the the critical um, the the critical piece that that we know that healthy babies need healthy moms um, and and the, often the best medication for baby is going to be the medication that keeps mom well. And so um, that really factors heavily into our thinking. And whenever we think about safety of medications in pregnancy, we're thinking not just about kind of um, you know, should there or should there not be this medication, but we're thinking about potential risks for medication and what we know about specific medications and potential risk of leaving mom untreated or incompletely treated and having mom be sick during pregnancy in the postpartum period. And that carries known substantial risks as well. And so we are always kind of weighing that and then using medication to try to decrease overall risk for mom and for baby together. So um, I think it's really important that women are having conversations like that with their providers and not just hearing, you can take this, you can't take this, uh, because there's, there's no medication in pregnancy that, that has like a blanket kind of, you know, perfectly safe, no potential risk. Being ill in pregnancy is also not a risk-free endeavor. Um, and so we think about both of those things side by side. Right. So again, I think the feedback here is really that it should be individualized, right? But what we know is that it's critical. We do our best to keep mom healthy for a baby yeah. to be healthy. And so we kind of need to think about that full picture. Um, Absolutely. So Dr. Rohr, one of the, one of the things a couple of people are talking about is OCD exploding after the birth of their first child or anxiety exploding. And so let's talk a little bit about how common is it for people who don't have a previous OCD or anxiety diagnosis to see these symptoms or to first at least have them diagnosed, they may have kind of been there on and off after pregnancy. Um, I, yes, I will. I wanted to ask really quickly, um, Dr. Netherton, would you recommend the, piece, the PSI psychiatric consult line? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. so that's maybe, maybe, maybe uh, Liz, we can pop that in the chat, but um, yeah. Postpartum Support International has a consult line that psychiatrists can call or schedule an appointment with. It's totally free to discuss medications during the perinatal and postpartum period. It's it's a cool resource um, and definitely something that, that people should take advantage of. Um, That's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, we have that in. Okay. Um, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head of, of how many people develop OCD after pregnancy that never dealt with it before. I do, um, you know, you, you kind of mentioned this, maybe they had it kind of off and on. I do think that what we are seeing more is these kind of clusters of how people tended to cope with negative feelings and anxiety before, even if it never reached the level of impairing their functioning or their vulnerabilities were never quite as significant as they are during pregnancy. What, what you were referring to with the sleep, eating, exercise. I always talk about with my patients, I call that your vulnerability range. And so sometimes you're very vulnerable to dealing with, to doing coping mechanisms that make 
um, make matters worse long term, but make the pain go away in the moment. And sometimes you're not as vulnerable. You've got more of a cushion because you've got everything in place. And after pregnancy, you're at you're very, very vulnerable to these um, to old coping me mechanisms popping up or kind of new onset um, issues popping up. And again, there's this sense of there are all of these different factors that come into play, including your social support, including um, what happened during the pregnancy, um, sometimes or during the pregnancy, but also during the delivery itself. Um, we are starting to talk more about traumatic deliveries and how that delivery process, the fear of losing um, your own life or your baby's life can lead to a lot of anxiety um, afterwards and a lot of starting to avoid some of the things that bring on the anxiety. Um, so it's, I, I wish I had the exact numbers off the top of my head. I don't know. Hey, Elizabeth, do you have them? <laughs> I just want to say, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. McAvoy. No, I was just going to say, so I've heard numbers of upwards of 20% of people with OCD diagnosed in adulthood or diagnosed postpartum. Um, I don't know that we've done any like new research on that or, or any updated research, but I certainly think that it is important for us to know. And we're actually seeing this. I'm seeing a couple of people say, I never dealt with OCD until after my kids or OCD, right? So I do think it's important for us to acknowledge that some of us have OCD and it increases postpartum, right? But for some people, we do see mental health anxiety for the first time, or at least being diagnosed for the first time in the postpartum period. Yes. And the, we think that the overall prevalence of OCD in the postpartum period, we think is somewhere between four and 9%. Um, but that's likely an undercount that is likely really underrepresenting the symptom burden, um, because a lot of moms um, are really fearful about talking about it. A lot of moms don't seek help, don't come to anybody's attention, don't share. And especially if um, some of the intrusive thoughts and obsessionality is around the idea of harming the baby, um, then they really don't tend to talk about that with providers. And so I think four to nine percent is a um, probably a dramatic underestimate. I, and, and I'm like sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, like Jeff and IOCDF, we have to do way more because four to nine percent is much higher than the general population. So the yeah. general population writes two to three percent of individuals who live with OCD. And we know that's a huge number. And so four to nine, I agree, it's probably an underestimate, but even that it's alarming to think, yeah. oh, oh my gosh. And, you know, it was interesting. I had so many people who were my good friends who know my work and know what I do, but had so much anxiety to talk about what they were struggling with because nobody ever diagnosed them with postpartum OCD. People kept saying anxiety or what, but it was very clear unwanted intrusive thoughts. It was harm thoughts around their babies. It was very clear OCD. And when they talked about it, it was often after they had gotten some general counseling or general CBT work and they were feeling like, okay, I can talk about it. And I was able to say, wait a second, like, did you see an OCD specialist? They're like, no, why? And I'm like, this is OCD. Like, this is not just anxiety or depression. And so let's hop into that for a second, Dr. Roy. I think it would be great for us to kind of differentiate postpartum symptoms of when we would be when we would be saying like depression, anxiety, even psychosis compared to OCD. And we actually get that question a lot with individuals with OCD harm fears with their babies is how do I know it's not psychosis and what if I might act on it? And so I actually think us even talking about all four would be great. Yeah, I mean, the so the, the consistent piece that we are referring to is the thoughts that you're going to have in each. And um, there's unfortunate, you know, Fortunately or unfortunately, there's quite a bit of overlap between the four of them, uh, not the four of them, but there's an overlap between a few of them. So these, um, this experience of OCD can lead people to become depressed and so that they can have OCD and depression. Um, the experience of depression leading to sleeplessness and attempts to manage it can then lead to OCD. Um, so there are these, there, there's not as it's not as quite as categorical as I think we would like it to be. Um, and it's not as, which is reflected in our inability to kind of screen appropriately um, and our, you know, our inability to really do have really clear research about what people are dealing with. So if we kind of think about the thoughts that people have, um, the intrusive thoughts are sort of a hallmark of an OCD experience. Um, intrusive thoughts about harming the child, a lot of times they're violent or sexual. And sometimes that we do, I, I have, clinically seen that more in people with a sexual trauma background, but it doesn't have to be. That doesn't have to be there. Um, when the thoughts are unwanted, this is a very, this is kind of a very key component. And I always mix up ego dystonic and syntonic. And so I don't know how important it is to, to really explain that appropriately right now. 
but there's the sense that the the thoughts are coming from someone else versus like having been placed in. It, there's all this kind of stuff about it. But to me, the key issue is: are these thoughts unwanted? Um, sometimes people find them disgusting. They find them terrifying, and that can really lead to the exacerbation of specifically OCD because you're trying to push them away and make them go away. Um, the that's also what we'll see a lot of compensatory behaviors in OCD. So a lot of checking behaviors. Um, there is a device called the Owlet. I don't know if people have heard of the Owlet. It is a, it is my, my newest, um, crusade is against the Owlet because I think it really leads to an exacerbation of OCD behaviors. It is like a perfectly packaged reassurance seeking, um, that you can purchase and feel like a good mom for, for using it. Um, it's a device that goes on your baby's foot as soon as they're born and um, they, um, it has this horrible alarm, but you can monitor everything on your baby the whole time. And I think a really difficult thing, and I've been, I've, this has come up a lot this week, which is just the theme of this week, is the, I know I'm losing a thread here, Dr. McAmel, so I'll come back to it. But when you have a baby, there is a, this sort of intrinsic terror that you cannot completely always protect that baby. And what we do is we have all of these different ways that we try to manage that. I, I'm saying terror because I think it is a very real like terror, a very kind of hind brain. And so some of the things we do are these compensatory behaviors and then the obsessions. And we'll see that in OCD with anxiety. Um, I, I almost wonder if post, if most of the anxiety we see is actually postpartum OCD. Um, if the overlap there is more than we than we really think, because it's you, we are so reinforced for engaging in the reassurance seeking and then the checking behaviors. You're just doing a good job. You're you're checking on your baby. Depression. We're going to see more potentially. Um, the thoughts are really what I think differentiate differentiates the depression. So you'll have a lot of thoughts, cognitions, not, not just about this is really hard, but this child should have a different mother. Um, I'm, I'm not cut out for this. Um, this was all a huge mistake. We see these thoughts, this anhedonia, the sadness for weeks, as opposed to just like a few days, which would be kind of common with the baby blues. And so I, I recognize that I'm talking about them more diffusely than I think we would like to be able to, but I think that's because they are quite diffuse. I think there's quite a bit of overlap there, um, which again is why OCD and anxiety get so missed because it just sort of gets lumped into depression. Yeah, lumped into depression. And I think OCD certainly gets lumped into anxiety, right? If you think about if you are treating somebody with OCD symptoms, but you're not an OCD specialist, a lot of times you're not really assessing for that core fear, right? Is the core fear that you're going to harm your child or is the core fear that, um, that, that you've done something wrong, right? And so instead, what ends up happening from the surface is it looks like I'm just feeling anxious and I'm feeling overwhelmed. And I think my biggest frustration is that it gets a little bit normalized and in turn i think the normalization is important right when we think about stigma reduction i talk a lot about this but it's also important to recognize that it's it's not they don't have to accept that level of suffering right and i think that this is a thing i've been talking a lot about in the ocd field in general is that i think a lot of individuals myself included who live with ocd at some point or in their life or maybe even right now have started to understand that like oh having ocd means i have to accept that i'm gonna have to suffer forever and i'm like that is not what this means like there is effective treatment and i feel like in the postpartum period there's just this like well you're you're supposed to be struggling like you're supposed to you know breastfeeding's hard and this is hard and like it makes sense and like oh yeah it's hard for everyone kind of like this like blanket like oh yeah it sucks but like it's supposed to suck instead of when you're saying no i'm i'm struggling and and i need some help um and i think that that's the piece i really want us to to think about is like when is it right oh i had one intrusive thought or like you know that's kind of this nor these normal thoughts i have compared to I need to seek treatment and what are signs and symptoms that the individual, but also the family member can be looking out for. Cause I think that's really, really important. So maybe Elizabeth, you could touch on that a little bit. Yeah. I wanted to add in there that, um, that I think there is, there is, there are aspects um, of, of the symptoms that women with postpartum OCD tend to, tend to manifest. Um, aspects that get really rewarded in our culture um, and, and really encouraged in a lot of ways. 
Um, a lot of the new moms that I work with use apps to track their baby's feeds and to track when their baby, you know, wets their diaper and track their breast milk. And, and that tracking, again, I think gets kind of culturally rewarded. We see that and we think, oh, mom's doing a good job. Mom's, mom cares about the baby, mom's on top of it. And those of us that work with moms with OCD know that that can really rapidly veer into really problematic territory with a high degree of obsessionality, a high degree of distress, really difficult um kind of difficult to self-soothe around um, all of this kind of tracking and data and is it correct and what do i do if it's not quite right um and and so i think that's one of the ways that that ocd can kind of wind up flying under the radar um, or not get not get diagnosed not get um, recognized by providers and by other loved ones and, and i saw i saw a question back here in the chat about you know does postpartum ocd only show up as fear of physically harming the baby and the answer is absolutely not um, there are a whole number of different kinds of symptoms um, that folks can have with postpartum ocd and a really common one um, revolves around obsessionality around feeding um, another really common one involves um, fears of contamination of the baby and then kind of repetitively trying to um, uh, kind of ensure that the baby is clean enough, ensure that baby bottles are clean enough, um, repetitively washing the baby or, or other things that might come into contact with the baby. So the one, um, the one I want to make sure um, it's actually really interesting. We're talking about this and uh, I'm having like I, I and everyone knows I'm pretty open about my own journey with OCD in this in these forms, but feeding has been something that my daughter has really struggled with. She ended up having a dairy allergy and acid reflux, and so it's just been like a really tough journey that I get emotional about because it got to a point where feeding in and of itself was so anxiety provoking. Of like, is she going to take enough? Oh my gosh, what does this mean? And like tracking weights and. I'm a big believer that the scales and stuff aren't helpful. They weren't helpful for me at least because it just became this constant anxiety of like, and what is like weighing her three times a day actually doing except causing more problems. And I actually never even, even myself, like I never correlated that back to OCD. And now as we're sitting here talking, I'm like, wow, it was becoming pretty intrusive of like intrusive thoughts and, and getting to a point where I was starting to engage in avoidance. Like I was feeling a lot of relief if someone else was doing the feeding. And if I, could like avoid having to be there for a feeding period, which is, and babies can feel that, right? Like even she would start to sense that as well. And so I think it's really important for us to reemphasize what Dr. Netherton was just saying, which is that absolutely OCD comes in a million forms, right? It is not going to be just harm. And I will tell y'all I'm open about it because I think it's important for us to talk about taboo topics, right? But I've had a lot of sexual intrusive thoughts about my daughter and I know how to deal with those and I know how to still give her the bath and not give in. But at the same time, if I didn't, I think I'd be in a really different space right now. And so when you think about all the ways OCD can interfere with someone's life, we have subtypes, but there's also off-brand types we deal with, right? That like, maybe this doesn't fit in a subtype, but it comes back to what Dr. Rohr was just saying. Is it an unwanted intrusive thought, right? That's the obsession. And is there any sort of either repetitive behavior or compulsion that we engage in or avoidance, right? It's really important for us to remember that avoidance plays the OCD cycle the same way as a compulsion. So if you find that you're kind of avoiding doing these things because of the anxiety and what it's going to cause, you, you know, that, that certainly is one way we would want to look at a very similar behavior to a compulsion. It feeds the cycle the same way. So I really, yes, I think it's great for us to talk about all the different ways OCD can impact, um, can impact us postpartum. I think the next question um, that's important before we hop into treatment that I just want to address is what are signs and symptoms that family members could look for or that the individual can look for? So I'll give an example, but I was struggling a little bit with postpartum, both OCD that kind of also maybe turned into some depression. And as Dr. Rohr mentioned, right, I'm in the field, like I feel like I should know this and, and sometimes it gets the best of you and you, you sit back and I remember I love my husband. I'm not trying to say anything negative, but I remember telling him, I said, you know, Matt, I think I'm struggling a little bit with some postpartum and depression and I'm, I'm struggling. I'm feeling anxious about my attachment to my daughter and his response, God love him. And it, it was intended to be very sweet. Right. But his response is like, Oh no, Liz, like you're fine. You love her. I see you with her all the time and y'all love each other. Like you love her so much. And I'm like, yeah, like you're not hearing what I'm telling you. Like I'm not, yeah, that's not the problem. Like, yes, I love her, but I'm trying to explain to you that like 
I'm struggling. Like there's something that like, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. Right. But I can feel that something feels off. And so how can we encourage family members? Like if the individual saying that, make sure you're listening and make sure you're taking them to someone who understands postpartum anxiety, OCD, and the treatment of it. But also if they aren't talking about it, what are some of the things people might notice that then would make them say, Hey, like, are you struggling? How can we make sure we get you support as well as the mom? I wanted to, to jump in there and say, um, when I was when I was a wee baby trainee, um, I remember asking one of my mentors um, about like, gosh, I'm seeing all of these pregnant and postpartum women. How do I really kind of gauge what normal is and what a normal amount of distress is and what a normal amount of anxiety is? Um, how do I benchmark that? And I remember <laughs> telling me, you know, of, of course, we attend to distress that people voice um, and, and go back to that. And when women are voicing distress, that should um, that's what should grab our attention. Um, not kind of, well, she's supposed to be distressed, it's postpartum, or, you know, it, it, that that in and of itself tells us that, that we need to be thinking about um, both better assessment and, and potentially additional intervention. Yeah, no, absolutely. Dr. I also, I also think, um, you know, I, I'd like to back up to um, how do we have these discussions before you're in the midst of it, trying to figure out what to do? Um, I had a, I had a very similar, and it's so interesting that you commented on your attachment to your child because I had the same in, in depression. I had the same fears, and it was, um, and this is something that I've talked with Dr. Netherton about quite a bit. Is wanting a screening that's a little less based on the outward symptoms and a little bit more based on the internal experience and how, because um, that's how I finally realized I had PPD was I was looking in there. I, I, I know how to game the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. I know what to say on that. <laughs> like, I know what to say. So nobody's going to try and call me and make me talk to them about it. But finding those cognitions about, I'm scared that I'm not attaching to my child. I'm, um, I, I think I should, my child should have those, that attachment piece in the sense that you're not attaching the way that you want to, not, not necessarily the way you should be, the way that you want to. I think that's a, that's a kind of an interesting and I think probably very common experience. And we see that. I mean, we see that empirically, that the, that the attachment does look different when people are in greater distress at the beginning. Um, but I, I honest, I mean, I think you said it already. The thing that people should look for is that avoidance piece. Are you avoiding changing diapers because you're, you're scared you're going to do something or every time you do change their diaper, you worry, did I touch them? Did I do something wrong? Are they still dirty? Um, you're, you're, you know, you're avoiding giving baths for the same reasons. You don't want to take them to doctor's appointments. You don't want to sit with them. You can't listen to the crying. And then if the obsessions or the compensatory behaviors are interfering with sleep or interfering with not, so this is, I think what gets so tough with the Edinburgh is, is it asks about sleep, but it needs to, we, we need to say above and beyond, you know, infant infant disruption already. So I, I can't sleep because I'm thinking like I have a patient with who had postpartum OCD and she couldn't sleep because she was worrying about um, whether he was sleeping. And so she would get up and check and get back in bed and get up and check and get back in bed. And and it's um, so starting to interfere with some of those behaviors that otherwise could reduce your vulnerability to um, to the mental health, to the psychiatric experience. So that's exactly what I was going to add in that um, when I am seeing moms postpartum that are not struggling with OCD, um, they will engage in many of the same um, initial behaviors that women with OCD do, right? Women, the, the tricky part about postpartum OCD is often the obsessional thinking or the compulsions revolve around things we have to do anyway. We can't not feed the baby. We can't not check on the baby. We can't not bathe the baby or somebody's got to be bathing the baby. So, so, so these are all behaviors that, that folks are engaging in. Um, but for folks who don't have OCD, they might be able to check on the baby once. They're reassured the baby is okay um, and then can move forward. I'm going to enjoy my next, you know, I'm going to enjoy my free hour and take a nap. I'm going to watch, you know, a movie with my spouse, whatever it is. Um, but for women who are struggling with OCD postpartum, of course, we know that checking, um, engaging in the compulsions only reduces the anxiety marginally for a few minutes or for a few seconds or for a brief period of time. And then we have to check again. And we have to check again. And and so so really looking for those repetitive behaviors. Does, does doing it, um, does checking once give you relief? Does it, um, and does it give you lasting relief? You know, I know baby's okay, now I can move forward. Or are we still stuck on that same idea, that same worry, that same intrusive thought and needing to check again and again? 
Right. So, so everyone here, when you're, when you're listening, right, what I want you to hear is the same thing you hear with OCD, right? Mm-hmm. What we find is that we're searching for certainty, right? We want to be sure the baby's okay. We didn't do something wrong. Something bad's not going to happen, whatever that fear is. And no matter how much we engage in those rituals, we don't actually find certainty, right? We get stuck. And so we find ourselves repeatedly stuck in them compared to maybe a friend without OCD, you know, who puts their baby down for bed and maybe they have the monitor and if they hear a noise, they'll look, but otherwise they're not worried about it. It, There's a big difference, right? And being able, some checking is normal and is actually warranted with babies and infants, but, but some is obviously very clearly OCD and how do we separate the two? I think this is where it gets a little bit more caught up, right? Most individuals with OCD, we have this hyper sense of responsibility, we are responsible for this new baby's life, right? And so, of course, there's this piece where it feels like the weight and the importance is so high, and it is so high, right? But it doesn't need to be high for OCD because our OCD behaviors don't actually keep our baby any safer. Um, they don't actually prevent anything from happening, right? It's, it's just for OCD, which can never be appeased, and so it becomes this endless cycle. And I and think there's also, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, please. I was going to say, I think there's also a a bit of a different kind of um, dynamic or or new dynamic with postpartum OCD where there is a social endorsement of those behaviors that's not there before the baby. You are encouraged to weigh your baby three times a day. Check the baby. Of course, you got to check the baby. There's all the kinds of things that can happen. So there's there's this built-in thing that you're fighting against with OCD and with other, you know, with all of the perinatal disorders, but with OCD, I, I think a lot like the outlet that I refer to. Oh, good moms, check. So there is this sort of bit of um, how, you know, along with the hypersensitive responsibility, um, how do I be a good mom while fighting these thoughts that are telling you, you know, you're a bad mom because you did these things. And so it's, I, I think that that's, that's just something to be very aware of, that there's going to be this additional dynamic that you'll be kind of contending with in that, in that moment. You'd be careful to not compare to, right? Like sometimes we compare to moms and we think, oh, well, they don't have OCD and they're doing that. So like I should be doing that or it's okay. And it's great, but it's, it's very different, right? The outlet for one person can be like a helpful tool that they just, you know, have and that they rarely ever check. And for another person, the outlet can be completely destructive and interfering with the entire relationship you have with sleep and your baby and your own personal life, right? Mm-hmm. So um, important to think about. So I know we have some questions, so I definitely want to get to those. But before we do, I want to talk for a second about treatment. So most of the folks on this forum understand the basics of ERP, medication, mm-hmm. a combination of both being the most effective treatment for OCD. CD. Can both of you talk about how they're what what some of the differences might be when we're talking about postpartum um, depression, anxiety, and or OCD, but in particular OCD is treatment different, and what might be some of the differences in the course of treatment during this time frame compared to not? You want to go first? I I can jump in with the medication and say that, again, our focus is on keeping mom well. And so the the major difference in treatment with postpartum OCD is that we are also um, keeping an eye on whether mom is breastfeeding. And if she's breastfeeding, then we're thinking potentially a little bit differently about medications um, and that we're giving moms counseling about potential risks of breastfeeding with medication. That being said, most of the medications that we use to treat OCD, we know quite a bit about for breastfeeding. Um, We use a standard for women who are nursing um, that we like for for deciding whether a medication is, quote, safe for breastfeeding. Um, And we like to see that that medication transmits at less than 10% of baby's dose by weight um, into the breast milk. And so the medications that we use most commonly for OCD, especially the SSRIs, um, we encourage moms to continue breastfeeding. Transmission of those medications tends to be very low and babies tend to do quite well. Um, we, we used to, to, I think a long time ago, unfortunately, used to approach things from a very conservative perspective of, you know, if you're pregnant, you can't take medication. If you're breastfeeding, you can't take medication. Good luck to you. And, and I don't know why we thought that was going to go well for anybody uh, because it doesn't. And so, again, we know that healthy babies need healthy moms, and we tend to err much more on the side of breastfeeding um, now, and and we keep an eye on the baby. And and if baby were to develop symptoms or develop complications, then at that point, we would would take a look at it. Uh, But most of these medications, babies do quite well on nursing. Dr. Rohr, from a behavioral perspective, we'd love to hear your insight. Dr. Rohr, 
we'd love to hear your insights from a behavioral perspective. Sorry, you might have frozen for a second. I did. I was like, what happened? <laughs> yeah, so behaviorally, I mean, I think it's sort of in, in line with what we've been talking about the rest of the time. ERP is still the most well uh most well researched and most effective treatment for OCD in the postpartum period. Um, I think the context is very important, kind of thinking about how to approach this. Um, I know I get very um, protective and defensive about postpartum moms. Um, I do think that there is a, um, I, I would love to see more education for providers around um, what it will look like in the postpartum period. Um, I Just, just an example, I, I worked with a woman who had developed some postpartum OCD, and she brought information to me about um, in, in people with OCD who can sometimes have sexual intrusive thoughts with a groinal response. And she gave me, asked me to read the document before I talked with her because she had had such negative reactions from providers in the past. And I know that this is not an, a novel experience for people who have seen providers unfamiliar with OCD. Um, I, I think that people get, and Dr. Netherson and I talk about this all the time, people get extra, extra, extra touchy when there are kids in the picture. And so they can um, say things that can be really harmful. Providers can say things. That, and so I think it's really important to try to seek out um, somebody who has expertise in treating OCD and can recognize that those thoughts, I mean, I almost want, I'm not going to go that far, but I was going to say, I think if, I was going to say there are providers who treat OCD very well. They're providers who are very well-versed in postpartum mental health. The overlap is a, is a small population of people. Um, so I, I think finding the provider who's going to do that work is, is going to be a little bit difficult, which is again, why I think getting a preventive strategy in place and ahead of time and a planning strategy is, is really going to be our best, our best bet. There is some burgeoning research. Um, I think Abramowitz is doing most of it on using acceptance and commi commitment therapy as an adjunct for ERP, um, as a like predecessor to getting into ERP. I really like that. I have found that doing ERP with women postpartum, sometimes they're not willing to do some of the things that you need to do, which I, again, is not uncommon, in, especially if ERP is not, um, is not kind of explained in the correct way. Liz, you and I talked about this for a while, a, a little while back. Um, but it's still, I mean, that's still the gold standard treatment for it. It's just the context, I think, can be a little bit different. 100%. You know, so I think ERP is what we know is the most effective treatment for OCD across the board. Um, that we, there is some, some of the research shows that ACT with ERP can be just as effective as ERP, but it doesn't show that ACT can be more like that it's more effective or as effective alone as ERP necessarily. And so I think as, as Dr. Burr mentioned, right, using it in conjunction, Here's the piece I'll say. Um, I would rather you see an OCD specialist than see somebody who does general mental health that says they deal with postpartum who doesn't understand OCD because all of us who are OCD specialists should be able to help guide you through the OCD work even in a postpartum period. But I hope we're collaborating on a team. If you can find anomalies like Dr. Roar and Dr. Netherton who do both, Netherton who do both, like please right, seek those out. That is going to be so much more useful. But if that doesn't exist in your area and you only kind of have to choose an OCD specialist or somebody who, you know, does some general mental health um, postpartum work, I would choose the OCD specialist. Now, no, when you go to that OCD specialist, the OCD community is small. They may be able to give you a direct referral to somebody else who also uh, can do specific OCD and postpartum work together. And so that certainly would be ideal. Um, Jamie, I do want to make sure I answer a couple of your questions. You've asked for some resources um, and stated that you really would like to get some treatment. It sounds like OCD did increase for you in the postpartum period. So I absolutely encourage you to please go to IOC cdf.org. You can click on the find help tab. You can put in your zip code and providers in your area will show up. The big thing you want to look for is does, does this provider treat OCD? Do they have background in ERP? And then also on the IOCDF website, we can click if we do work um, postpartum and in the, in the perinatal or postpartum period. So you can see if there's specialists in that area that do that as well. 
The second piece is depending on where you live, there are also OCD affiliates across the country. So in Texas, we have OCD Texas and California, there's OCD SoCal, right? There's different affiliates. And sometimes those affiliates will also be able to help guide you to people who do some of the more specialized OCD, um, anxiety, depression, and perinatal or postpartum work. But the takeaway from today is ERP is still the gold standard treatment. Um, it is really important if you live with OCD and you are pregnant or planning to get pregnant to kind of be aware, right? I don't want I don't want anyone to be at a place where I was where I had fear around pregnancy and that I was scared and didn't know if I could do it, right? That isn't the place we want you to be. But what we want you to be is aware, right? We want you to have a plan with your family to kind of, you know, I know I sat down with my husband and said, hey, if you see these signs, like I want you to encourage me to seek treatment. Otherwise, if I'm seeking treatment, like here's what it might look like and here's the help I might need. The more we can have those open and honest conversations with people that we love, the more we'll, we'll be set up to help support one another. If you're a family or friend, a loved one watching this webinar, I want to encourage you to listen. Listen to what the individual's telling you um, and also observe, right? If you see that the way that they are struggling seems out of the ordinary. It seems like it's impairing functioning or impacting the relationship they have with their newborn or even with you. Encourage them to consider seeking support and support them in that process because they definitely will need that. There is a lot of stigma around mental health to begin with. There's a lot of stigma around OCD in particular, the taboo types of OCD, but there's even more so when it's around your child. All right? There is so much anxiety of how we're supposed to feel if we are a parent and um, the way the relationship we're supposed to have with our kid that if that's being impacted, our like willingness to talk about that and share is obviously um, going to be anxiety provoking, right? And something that we might avoid. So um, final thoughts and, and the thing I'll end with before I'll hop to you, Dr. Netherton and then Dr. Rohr is just to remember that treatment works. And I know today we've been talking a lot about what do you look for? What are the signs? What are the symptoms? How do you get support? But I want to end with the fact that treatment is still extremely effective, even in the postpartum period, right? OCD treatment and interventions for OCD are one of the most effective mental health interventions that exist. We know ERP has amazing efficacy rates, sometimes up to 70%. And we have no reason to believe it wouldn't be similar in the postpartum period if you're with an OCD specialist. And so I want to make sure you're still leaving today with a lot of hope and understanding that um, a lot of us are dealing with what you're dealing with if you're struggling with it, but treatment exists and treatment works and you can find the relief so that the relationship with your child isn't impacted um, or certainly disrupted by OCD or anxiety. So Dr. Netherton, any final thoughts that you have? No, I think you covered it. Just emphasizing that um, I think a lot of times when folks present to me, they're thinking about medications um, as a sole treatment. I think sometimes when folks present to Dr. Rohr or, or you, sometimes they're thinking about um, ERP. And, and often um, when folks are really struggling, we know they need both. And so just emphasizing that um, we really need people to be seeing good um, OCD specialists for um, therapy if, if we're even talking about medications. 100%. Dr. Rohr? Yeah, you, I mean, you said it beautifully. I, I was thinking about a, a success story, a patient that um, Dr. Netherton and I shared who had um, developed OCD. Um, we worked through ERP um, and she was doing well. And then she had her second child and um, she was still doing okay, but we were, we were kind of working together and they had an experience where somebody tried to break in at a certain time of night. And so she, I saw her a week later and every night she had been staying up later and later and later trying to prevent the break in by being awake. And because we were working together, because we had the team, you know, we were able to kind of intervene more quickly before that became this longer standing, more sort of, uh, I guess, rigid pattern. And it was really effective and it was just, it was really nice. And so like, like you said, Dr. Netherton, being able to have uh, multiple providers on board and getting them communicating with each other um, is, is just, I mean, it can be really magical. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I'm a big believer in having a team that collaborates, right? Make sure that your psychiatrist and your therapist, whether it's psychologist or whatever type of provider you're going to, that they collaborate and work together because that team approach is just so much better. And it allows us to really like, if, 
I'm seeing one thing, but Dr. Netherton was seeing another thing and Dr. Rohr was, right? We want to all be talking about that to help make the best decisions for you with all the information instead of pieces of information. And so the team approach is really important. And the good news is, is that across the country, there's various groups and various individuals that work collaboratively. Most OCD specialists either work within a group or if they work in private practice, they work with psychiatrists and with individuals, even if it's their own separate private practices, they're used to people that they collaborate with. So definitely, um, I encourage you to find that. And, and I think that working together is always better than isolation. The second piece that we've been talking about, prevention, 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 right? The, the, better off, we are so much better off if we know up front like hey i might struggle with that let right like i know if i'm able to have another child right i am going to be looking at my mental health and the postpartum period so much differently than i did the first time even though the first time i would tell you i was really prepared compared to the norm i'm going to be even more prepared because i know some of the ways that it impacted me that i might be looking out for but as we've heard today sometimes we're shocked and sometimes we weren't expecting or we weren't looking at this and it kind of creeps up on us and so the more you can recognize signs and symptoms and get treatment the better the chance you will have to be able to manage those symptoms quicker right early intervention is always key if possible so remember help and hope are always available thank you so much to our amazing panelists today this is an important topic what i want to encourage you to do is to make sure you visit iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind for two reasons i want you to see all of our upcoming events but i also want to encourage you to please make sure you submit questions and content that you want us to present on. So I know both Dr. Netherton and Roar would love to come back and we'd be happy to do a second part of this series. And now that we've kind of talked about the basics, but going more into case studies and more into detail, if that would be helpful, but we want to hear from you. So please let us know what you want to see so that we can make sure we're providing the content that would be most useful. Thank you both. I am so appreciative and uh, to the OCD community, thank you for joining and remember help and hope are always available.